In this video, I want to talk about consumption. In the last video, we talked about the idea of productivity or the fact that in the ecosystem, that how much energy is produced is going to determine how much the ecosystem can sustain. Because other things are going to be consuming those producers and that's going to power what we call the food web of the ecosystem. And if you look at the food web, you will see the transfers of energy that are taking place and you will understand that the more producers are in the ecosystem, the more photosynthesis is happening, the more, uh, the biggest the, the standing crop is, the more ad additional mass that's added to top of that all, ever so often, the more diversity the ecosystem can maintain and the more number of animals the ecosystem can maintain. That's why places like the rainforest, which are so diverse, have such huge amounts of production because that's what makes them so diverse, that's what makes the amount of life there so numerous, the fact that they have such a great amount of productivity. But that energy then gets consumed and transferred throughout the, the food web as animals eat up the matter that carries that energy in the organic compounds. Now, there are several levels of consumption, and we call these levels trophic levels. Trophic because trough means to eat. So trophic levels are the levels of consumption. You have, of course, the primary producers, which are not really consuming, although they do consume a fraction of the energy that they produce themselves. Remember that not all of the energy that's produced by them actually ends up in the uh, herbivore that ends up eating them. Those herbivores, by the way, which eat the primary producers are called primary consumers. They're the first level of consumption. Then you have the ones that eat them, which are the secondary consumers, the ones that eat those, which are the tertiary consumers, and the ones that eat those, which are quaternary consumers. Now, it is possible to have uh, more on top of that, but by the time you get the quaternary consumption, the energy level is so low, and we'll talk more about that in the next video, that it's very rare for you to see a food chain longer than this. Okay, and we'll explain why in the next video, but it has to do with the idea of production efficiency or secondary production of each one of these organisms. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the idea here is then that ecosystems have levels of consumption, which are called trophic levels. Now, when you are looking at these relationships in food webs and food chains, it's also important to realize that the level that a certain organism is sometimes does depend on whichever food chain you actually follow. Because, for example, the marsh hawk, which is our apex predator over here, if you follow along this line, one, two, there was only two steps to get to him, which means he's going to be a secondary consumer. But if you follow a different food chain, let's say the one that goes to the grasshopper and then to the harvest mouse and then to him, then you took three steps. Now he's a tertiary consumer. In another food chain, he might be a, a quaternary consumer. So it all depends on where you look, in which food chain you follow. So if you have to choose, if you're looking at it at a food web level, you have to consider which food chain you will actually care about. But if you want to look at the food web as a whole, we usually name the consumer at the highest level that he ever attains within the food web. So, for example, if he's a secondary consumer in one, tertiary consumer in one, quaternary consumer in the other, he's called a quaternary consumer because that's the highest level he ever attains to. But that's only if you're talking about it in a food web sense. Each food chain can also be considered separately if that's what you want to look at it as well. By the way, the animal... By the way, the animal at the highest level is called the apex predator. It's the predator that eats everybody else and nobody else eats them. Like the uh, orca on the right side, the food chain here, or the, the hawk that you see there. And on the food web you see on the bottom left, that would be the marsh hawk there. That doesn't get eaten by anyone, right? So they're the top level consumer. And these are some more examples of, of these apex predators, uh, animals which within the ecosystem dominate all other animals and include us, for example. Well, I was told you I was going to talk about this idea of secondary production. Now, what I'm talking about here is that the same thing that happens to the plant actually happens to every single organism. The plant makes up its own sugar, but then it ends up using some of its sugar for its life to grow, to develop, to reproduce, and so forth. The same thing is true about animals. When a bunny, for example, eats a, a plant, some of the energy that's available inside the plant uh, does not get even assimilated into the bunny because of some of the energy actually gets passed and he doesn't actually digest that and it just goes out in the feces. That's, talk, that's something that we call feed conversion ratio. That he is actually eating the food, but only a, a, some of that food actually gets converted into or assimilated into their body. So some of the energy is lost right there uh, to the ecosystem because it's wasted as, as waste. By the way, 
that waste does get picked up by and, pr pr and pr processed by by detrovores and decomposers and so it's not completely lost yet some of that matter still try to be recycled within the ecosystem and so, and so the energy as well but that is what's being assimilated but then from what's being assimilated some of that energy is going to be used up it's going to be released as heat to the environment it's going to use to maintain the temperature of of the heat some of it is going to be used for growth reproduction or for ingestion or for or the, which is the process of finding food and eating uh, some of it's going to be used for excretion some of it is going to be used for all kinds of purposes by the time this bunny is done using up the energy that it actually assimilated only a fraction of the original energy is actually left up. By the way, of all these processes, the one that wastes the most energy, you would think it would be excretion because that's the one where matter is basically passing through the animal and not even being captured. Not the energy is just being wasted into outside, literally waste. But actually, cell respiration is the one that produces the most heat in the ecosystem on these animals. When the animal is going through its life cycle and is performing cell respiration, that burning of that sugar that happens at the cellular level releases so much energy that's not efficiently captured. Just like in photosynthesis, the energy of the sun is not completely captured. The energy that's in that glucose is not completely captured. It's even worse than photosynthesis, actually. It's almost less than 20% efficient. That means 80% of the energy will sometimes be wasted. And that means that cell respiration, even though it's the process that keeps us all alive, is not the most efficient way to do so. All right, it's a very important concept. We'll talk more about that when we do cell, cell respiration. And we also mention it as we hit evolution and talk about how come there's not a perfect system that we have over here. Okay? And in fact, in the wild, very rarely organisms end up having more energy than they actually need. And if they do, what they do is that they store the energy for future use. In fact, and that means that they grow biomass. Same thing as you and I. If you eat a burger, and that inevitably some of the energy from the burger is going to be used for you to do everything you do throughout the day but if you don't use all of that energy the rest becomes sugar reserves and if you don't use those sugar reserves the body ultimately transfers that into fat which adds to your biomass now you're increasing your biomass that's called uh, production right in a way you didn't really make the sugar but you added sugar to your biomass so that's called secondary production or the idea that every animal every link in the food chain adds biomass to that link. That is what you have to think about when you think about how much can that link sustain. Because just like the amount of production determined how many herbivores could leave it, live in the ecosystem, the amount of biomass that the bunny is adding to itself determines how many carnivores that eat that bunny can survive. So that's the idea of secondary production or the production efficiency of the bunny. The idea is the bunny will eat, but only assimilate a fraction of it because of that feed conversion ratio. Some of it doesn't get digested. Some of it just passed on as feces. And then, uh, on top of that, some of its own energy is going to be used up throughout its life. So that means that only a fraction of its energy is going to be used to increase the biomass of the bunny for him to become fatter and store that for future use the same way the plants were storing that sugar for future use. So only a fraction of the original energy is of the plant actually ended up in the bunny because the plant used some. Likewise, only a fraction of that energy was assimilated by the bunny and then only a fraction of that was not used by the bunny. Which means the secondary production is the amount of energy that the bunny consumed but did not use, which then the next link in the food chain can, that can eat. And this type of production efficiency is going to limit the amount of energy available to the next level of the food chain. And we'll talk more about that on the next video uh, and explain how that ends up causing limits to how big the food chain can be and to the numbers on the food chain and so forth.